You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the Advisor's Option. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, where we break down all of the sometimes scary, sometimes complex, sometimes just intricate world of options and explain how you, the busy financial advisor, asset manager, maybe you're someone looking for those services for yourself, (laughs) how you should be using these products, how you could help your clients use these products or what you should be looking for. And an advisor, if you are looking for them right now, I'm guessing a lot of you probably are interested in such services right now. My name is Mark Longo from the aforementioned network as well as, of course, from theoptionsinsider.com. Happy to be back on the old program. Make sure you can catch us live or indeed after the fact 
however you listen, make sure you send in those questions, those comments. We do indeed love to hear from you, and so do my cohorts. Joining me on the program today, first, let's kick it off with the director of risk himself, Mr. Chris Hausman, the portfolio manager, a.k.a. the managing director of risk, a.k.a. the director of risk over there at Swan Global Investments. Mr. Director of Risk, welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you very much, and I didn't know I had so many AKAs. I'm going to have to figure out uh, something to do with all that AKA. It's the, the law enforcement folks, don't blame me. You know, they're the ones who, who <laughs> put these profiles together. We just, we just read them here on the air. And also joining us, a man just known as Matt, Mr. Matt Amberson, uh, the founder over there at Orats. They have an AKA, AKA Options Research and Technology Services. Mr. Matt, welcome back to the program. To you as well, sir. Thank you. We do live in interesting times, Mark, don't we? We do. You know, I was just thinking, you know, there's not really a lot going on, so maybe we should just cancel the show this month. What do you think? Not a lot to talk about. What, what do you think? Yeah, it's tough to find things, but I, I, let's, let's, let's push ourselves and find something. All right, we'll soldier on. Just for you listeners, just for you folks out there, we'll keep going as we head on into The Buzz. Busy financial advisors and asset managers don't have time to follow the latest developments from the world of options. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody, welcome to the buzz, the portion of the program where we break down what is going on in the world of options and derivatives and volatility that maybe you overlooked or maybe you're busy out there actually managing your clients' accounts. You don't have time to pay attention to such things as the world of options and volatility. So we do it for you. I should mention here at the top of the segment, we will be joined in a a little bit, probably about uh, seven or eight minutes or so, by our old buddy, Mr. Eric Cott, the Director of Education and Business Development, particularly for advisors over there at the OIC. As he is wont to do, he's running fashionably late, but we'll get him on the program. Good to have him back for the first time indeed this year and indeed this decade, so that'll be fun. But before we get to that, there is a lot of stuff popping off here <laughs> in the buzz. My, my poor joke at the top of the program aside, uh, if, unless you're under a rock, you've been paying attention to what's been going on out there. What a strange environment we find ourselves in now. We were talking about this on our last episode, which doesn't seem like it was a month ago we all got together here, but it was. And now what we were talking about and everyone was hand-wringing about on the last episode seems kind of quaint by comparison. Coming out to the show last time, we were hand-wringing and worried about potentially the coronavirus impacting the markets at the time. The Dow had sold off about 454 points. Everyone was freaking out about that. Everyone loves the Dow, by the way, if you have these massive point totals they love quoting all the time of course fast forward a month and here we are back again talking once again you guessed it about the coronavirus of course those 400 plus point moves in the dow seem quaint now multiple thousand point sell-offs out there throughout the course of this week as coronavirus fears really crashing into the market this is something we were kind of debating on the show last time are we pricing this in accurately or is the market kind of shrugging it off at the time it seemed like the market was shrugging it off. Well, not so this week. It's hitting with like a bomb this week, starting on Monday and going on throughout the week. In fact, today we were rallying. It seems like most of that rally has has faded as we speak. And we saw some some impressive numbers earlier this week. Our old friend Vix Cash topping out about twenty nine and a half or so. Of course, if we keep on this pace, maybe we'll threaten that again. We'll see. Uh, Spike set about a similar level, right around twenty nine and a half. VXX, a product that does nothing but go down. Went up pretty strong this week, up to about 19 and a half out there as well. So we're racing the better part of the last few months' worth of erosion out there as well. Now, all this has been interesting from an overall volatility. Also, from a volume perspective, our buddy, the flow master, Mr. Schwartz, he put out an interesting tweet. He is the kind of keeper of all the flow data out there. And we just saw yesterday a new volume record for the overall options markets, so options like themselves a little bit of volatility, a little bit of movement. Maybe not this much, but they like it nonetheless. A new overall volume record, 40.7 million contracts changing hands yesterday. That blew away, as according to Henry, the blew away the prior record set in 2011. And, and interesting footnote, exceeds the entire industry, the entire option market volume for the year. Back in 1977 by a few million contracts. So uh, interesting stuff percolating out there. We did 40.7 million contracts. The day before the 24th, that was on the 25th. On the 24th, did 39 million. So a pretty hefty day there as well. You have to go back all the way to August 5th of 2019, where the volume was about 31 million. And then uh, May 13th of 2019, where you have about 24.6 million. And uh, I'm sorry, then in between there was... August 14th of 2019 with 27.9 million. So interesting data. I encourage you to check that out. Speaking of data, 
Let's start with you, Mr. Mr. Matt. You have a lot of data on your hands. Your data was eerily prescient on our last shows, I believe. Everyone else was kind of fading this thing, and you were coming in there saying, you thought this may have some legs, and you thought maybe we were in for a bit of a new volatility regime. And also, our listeners agree with you. We got a listener here, Nelai, perhaps. If I'm butchering that, I, I apologize. Nelai saying, Matt nailed it with his prediction for Vol last show. What are his models saying now? So, Matt, the listeners want to know. We want to know. First off, congrats. It's somewhat bad timing, but congrats on, on your earlier prognostication. Your models were clearly kicking in there. And B, uh, what are your models telling you now, sir? Yeah, I mean, part of what we do and see with accurate volatility is, is you can in, get these indicators uh, a little bit early when when the the market participants that might have some uh, advanced warning or good models, you know, they they start to come in, and we could see those um, pretty well. So, you know, what I look at, um, you know, is is the relationships between the volatilities and spy, obviously, and the VIX as well. But in the volatility, is that kind of breaking out? Uh, and it was back back uh, about a month ago. Now, when, when there weren't too many people talking about it, so how do I feel now? I th- I, th- I think it's hit. Uh, you know, I'm I actually look at this market width in volatility. So, how wide is the market in spy? And that what happens is when it gets really ugly. The market makers will, as you know, Mark, it just widen out, widen out the market. That's when they're really panicking. They can't, they can't uh, uh, hedge their trades that are coming in, so they have to widen out the markets. That has increased a bit. I mean, the most it's increased the most uh, in about a year, but it's not up to near. It's not nearly up to the blow off that we got back in uh, 2018 in December. Nor the vol again in 2018 in in uh, February. So I don't know. This thing's still. Th- I, I still think that we could see some uh, a little bit more carnage right now. You know, it does seem to have. Uh, you know, a lot of the news is out. When I was talking back uh, a month ago, I, you know, some of my news outlets were mentioning things that weren't being mentioned in the uh, mainstream media. Now they are. So. I still, we might get a little bit of a bounce here, but I think uh, over the next, I don't know, month or two, I think we're going to, we haven't seen the blow off that we need to see. So I think uh, it's going to be unfortunately pretty ugly. Probably, I don't know, I I would even think of testing the, I don't know, 270 range, maybe 250 range. Um, It's pretty bad, but that's what I called uh, originally a 20 to 40% correction because of this thing, Mark. I just want to know, is there room in the New Hampshire compound in case we need to strategically move out of Chicago for a little bit? You and the Rock Lobster, you're both nicely situated in the hinterlands there. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's, it, you know, there have been some lines at, uh, at supermarkets and, and that you see on, on TV. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be tough to be in a city, but you know, so many things are uh, – going in the favor of living a city now, including, you know, just delivery and just in time delivery. Now, how much is the supply line going to be cut? Who knows? But, uh, you know, for right now, I, I, it seems like they're going to, uh, you know, come through this, but, uh, you know, again, I, I, th- I think the other, the other shoe is going to drop here. Um, and, you know, it's going to, it might take them a little bit of time, but it, it's, it's, we've got a pretty good, blow off right here might get a little bit of relief and then i i think where there's going to be another leg down and then you know on, on to the onward march upwards as we're all all been accustomed to over the last 15 years yeah you know it did seem like nothing could derail the bull for a while there in fact i was just marking on this network not too long ago about how you know this bull market this long-lived bull market has withstood trade wars with our largest partners, potential shooting wars in the Middle East, large swaths of global crude production being wiped off the map, all these myriad things that would have derailed numerous other bull markets. And it seemed like in the beginning, at least, it was shrugging off this pandemic. And now, perhaps this week, it's finally starting to catch up with it. So it sounds like, sounds like Matt's models, if you were a bull and you were tuning in for a little bit more optimism, it sounds like Matt model. Matt's models, easy for me to say, don't have that in store for you. Let's turn now to the director of risk 
Mr. Director of Risk, there's a lot of risk to direct these days. So uh, what's been lighting up your tape and what is your what is your outlook on what we're seeing out there now from a volatility regime and overall market perspective, sir? Yeah, I just want to congratulate Matt, and it's a good thing we didn't record any of these shows the week of Valentine's Day. Um, but no, I saw the same signals uh, January 31st through about February 7th-ish at the latest that Matt was seeing that there was potential for some downside, and we're seeing the same signals right now. So from a technical perspective, I've been pounding the table that we need to test that breakout, which is around 30 quarter for months now. Um, and the 200-day moving average is around 30 half. So I, I definitely think there is in the short term more downside to at least the 200-day moving average, and maybe we will get some re- a relief rally at that point. Uh, but you're going to have some really good support to the 3,000 level. I think the 29 half, and I'm talking about the SPX, 29 half, 3,000 is going to be a battleground for the bulls and the bears. Uh, and if that does break, um, then I think you know what Matt just said is is very feasible going down to 2,700 um, at that point in, at that point in time. And then we'll see if that wants to break, which will open up that uh, that December 2018 low, which would get you know basically wipe out that entire year's rally. So. Um, you know, historically selling the VIX at 28, 29, 30 in this area is a pretty good trade. Uh, but you know, I do think, you know, we've got some unknowns now and it's, it's the virus news and you can see that, you know, markets were bouncing back today, maybe in a relief rally. And all of a sudden, uh, they came out and said that there were some potential cases in New York. And, and then I believe it was Cuomo came out and said, well, they all p- tested negative and then futures rallied 20 annals in about two minutes. So things are jittery. Uh, I think the VIX is definitely going to stay elevated here. We just have too many unknowns. Um, you know, we don't know where the virus is going to spread. And, and I think finally, um, you know, it is probably going to take a toll economically. Um, you know, 10 year rates were at all time lows, I believe yesterday. So I mean, markets are listening now. It's not the euphoria Trump tweet that everything is great and we're going to continue going to the moon type of environment. So it's very, uh, very important uh, right now. Um, you know, good to be hedged, good to be invested and hedged. Uh, but you also have to be very cognizant and, and tippy toe through income trades, which are short premium, right? There's going to be some defense. There's going to be a lot of rolling going on out there. Um, and that's going to move the markets with the, with the gamma shifting around as much as, much as it could, uh, you know, with these larger moves. Speaking of shifting around, we're going to shift around the host seats now because I do believe we are joined fashionably late, as always, by our old buddy, Mr. Eric Cott, the Director of Education and Business Development over there at the Options Industry Council. For the first time this year and indeed this decade, Mr. Cott, welcome back to the Advisors Option Program, fashionably late as always, sir. Well, Happy New Year to you, Mark, and to uh, Chris and Matt. Always nice to be with you. I wish, you know, I say this facetiously, I wish I had exercised the put for the technology that goes on in my building here down in the southeast because we had some uh, disruptions due to weather that uh, caused a little bit of an outage. So uh, my Skype was a little bit off and the phone, but I am glad to be here. So uh, thank you, gentlemen. Sorry for that with the technology. You never know what can happen. But you're joining us by that magic technology known as telephone. Very cutting edge, very avant-garde of you, sir. We're right. We're right on the cutting edge, and uh, I would I would sort of echo some of the sentiments of my my colleagues that uh, it's been a uh, interesting week, and 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 for me being at an advisor conference, the early part of it, it most certainly brought a lot of attention to the OIC booth mark because uh, I would say that advisors are not as complacent. And it, it was interesting because uh, was with a colleague of mine from one of the exchanges who was trying to get back to your wonderful state and avoid that snowmageddon of 2020. And, uh, and she definitely exercised the put and decided to leave at uh, 5 in the morning. Well, you know, I'm glad to have you on because I, I like to get the pulse of the advisor space, and you certainly are out there doing that. It sounds like you kind of just you just kind of broke it down for us. Uh, in fact, we're going to have spoiler alert listeners. We're going to get into some some hedging strategies in a little bit, which I know a lot of you have on the brain right now. But it sounds like Eric, as you've been going on, you spend your days. I know it's hard to believe, listeners, but he actually has things to do when he's not on this show, and he spends his days out there at advisor events and really getting the pulse of the boots on the ground advisor across the country. So it sounds like, from your anecdotal perspective, Eric that uh, advisors are really starting to shape up and start paying more attention to this, whether it's the pandemic or whatever is driving their concerns here. They are starting to get more interested in, shall we say, the uh, the hedging side of the space, sir. It's interesting, Mark, and I'm definitely going to have Matt and uh, Chris weigh in because Chris especially, given his team, that I 
was with at a large RIA conference this month and then hearing from advisors. Mark, when we all talked, the four of us, uh, late last year, advisors were definitely hearing from their clients about some of the concern that was evolving around this year with elections and things that were going on. Obviously, I just heard some of the comments from Chris and from Matt that when clients start to call, the advisors who sort of separated themselves from the masses that have already been talking about some hedging strategies, I actually got some emails from some of those colleagues this week who were conveying the message to me that they were already being defensive and they were already sort of having that conversation way before this month. However, the majority of other advisors that have maybe been reticent are now contemplating, thinking about some of these ideas that I know you're going to talk about in a little bit, but, you know, having, I guess, that insurance policy there in place. And we've talked about this before, Mark, you know, that sleep well at night. So I think it's definitely when something like this occurs and a lot of us talk about analogies and it's sort of that, you know, once in a hundred year storm that comes in, well, there are things that are going on, obviously, in the capital markets and, and all around the world. And I, 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 advisors have to be aware of that and be more proactive with their clientele. Definitely. Well, you know, from your perspective, Eric, you know, I was just talking before you got on here on the show, volume wise, which of course you come from OIC, which is part of OCC, which clears all these contracts. Volume wise, it has been an interesting time. I, we, I just mentioned at the top of the show, we've set multiple daily records just this, just this week on the 24th and the 25th. And we'll see how today plays out so far, so far, so good. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting from a volume perspective. I know January was also a pretty interesting month uh, from your overall perspective. I believe Mr. Cott, don't quote me, but uh, I, I do believe, sir, it was the most active January on record. Is that the case, sir? Well, it was it was one of the most active uh, January on record, Mark. So I, I won't quote you on that. But in the t- in the t- in the top three, yes, as far as uh, as far as January goes, and uh, we did we did set a record. You're you're right on uh, on Tuesday. Um, you know, more than uh, um, 42 million contracts, and and knowing from the history that you and Matt. And Chris do, uh, being in this industry for, let me see, if I combine all three of you together, Mark, how many decades or centuries would that be, the three of you? I don't know. I'm, I'm only 27 myself, so I don't go back that far. <laughs> but, yes, to answer your question, and, and I'll, you know, is that it's, uh, it's absolutely remarkable and, and, and a real team effort on the part of OCC and OIC to see that level of trading. But we're scaring people. We may scare you a little more when we get to the hedging a little bit. Before we do that, Matt, let's dial them back. Let's walk them back from the edge of the cliff. Let's look away from the macro focus for a second because I know you guys have your fingers on the pulse of all things micro. And you may have forgotten, listeners, but it is still earnings season. There are still big names popping off. Some of that is getting lost now in just the furor over all things coronavirus and Big names are reporting big numbers, and they're kind of just getting washed away along with the tide. But there is still a lot of interesting vol and analysis to be done on that side of the fence. Mr. Matt, catch us up, sir. The keeper of the earnings data, where do we stand so far? How are things progressing? How is the vol shaping up? And maybe any interesting surprises or takeaways from this season, sir? Yeah, and I have to admit I circled back to our earnings season report and only to find that uh, it's now – uh, switched so we whereas the owners of volatility uh, were getting hurt before uh, owning owning earnings moves now they're 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 doing okay so uh, rest assured mark the uh, the buyers of of volatility around earnings have made a comeback uh, we kind of called that last time too we said that you know as we move on into the earnings season you know we look at six weeks and generally uh, the first two weeks aren't very good for option owners, but then week th- week three, week four is usually the best, and then it kind of tails off after that, and that's what we've seen. Week four again, uh, whereas historically you've had an 11% positive return in week four, uh, we saw a 17% positive week, um, whereas it's usually about a break even. Now we've seen uh, option owners are up 5%. So. Mark, uh, the the bright side, not the dark side, has is winning this uh, this option season. 
I like that. A little bit of optimism. But we know a lot of you have the dark side on the brain, so without further ado, we thought we'd have a nice, timely Options 101 for you. It's time to learn how to use options to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. All right, everybody. Welcome to Options 101, the portion of the program where we break down how you, the busy advisor and asset manager, can utilize these options products in your own portfolio. We touched on this topic many times in the past. I encourage you, if you want a very, very deep dive, to head into the archives where we've touched on this before. But it's time to do an overview because, as Eric alluded to, everyone's got hedging on the brain these days. And market sells off, you know, a thousand plus points in the Dow and other things, and VIX is heading in on 30. Go figure. People have have some hedging on the brain. So we're going to get into that a little bit again because sometimes people, they just they can't be bothered to go back in the archives. They want it in their ears right now. So we're going to walk you through some basic and a little bit more advanced hedging strategies as well. Uh, Eric, before we get into that, you mentioned people were coming to your booth this week. Were they coming pretty much just to kind of dip their toes in and get a sense for basic hedging? Were they looking to get more involved? What was the general pulse of the clientele coming to uh, the OIC booth this week? You know, it's interesting, Mark, that there is a lot of these advisors obviously follow the news. And all four of us know when you have volatility like this and markets have significant drops, every news channel is picking up the story and talking about it. So it's not only what's going on in parts of Asia and other parts of Europe and stuff. They're also following these news channels are following capital markets. So advisors were certainly coming over and asking questions, you know, about, you know, ha- you know, what's, what's the, the best way to start having this conversation? Because, you know, here we are, you know, already down significantly, you know, and, you, you know, it's surprising when an advisor who's been managing money for a long time would say that, you know, is it, is it too late to do this? And, you know, are, are there, are there some other, you know, uh, ways that I could, uh, introduce this where I, I don't have to manage it all on my own. You know, are, are there are there sort of solutions that are out there that I can kind of bring someone else in? And i.e., I'm kind of teeing up a little bit of our colleague out in Puerto Rico or down in Puerto Rico. Can I can I find someone out there that can help uh, mitigate this risk where I'm not tied to my desk all the time and having to do that, you know, constantly? Yes, yes, I could certainly see that, particularly in this environment. A lot of advisors, you know, the time is an issue, as well as expertise. So hopefully we can help with the latter. The former, we can't do much for you, unfortunately, listeners. But maybe, as Eric alluded to, maybe, uh, maybe the director of risk and his crew over there can help you out. Well, let's outline some of these basic strategies you may be considering, and then we'll tweak them a little bit, get a little bit more advanced for you, maybe an options 201 there as well, tell you how you can help pay for some of this protection that everybody wants. Because as Eric alluded to right now, people are asking, is it too late? Is the horse already out of the barn? And so when you're looking at this strategy, let's start off with our most basic defensive play here, which is the basic protective put. Of course, a lot of you are along the S&P, so you want to buy some percentage out of the money put. That's going to vary depending on you and your client's needs. Usually it's somewhere around maybe 3 to 5%, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on, on how much protection uh, you want out there right now. That These days, that's going to cost you. <laughs> uh, so we'll get into the ways to pay for that in, in a second. But the, there are many pros to this type of strategy. First off, it gives you reliable protection. People often say, well, why do I need to put? I can just, my, I have my trigger finger. I can sit on the mouse button. And when it starts selling off, I can just hit that sell button and I don't need that put. I don't need to pay for all that protection. Well, in the environment we find ourselves in now, things just don't happen in U.S. trading hours. Things happen overnight. We have huge gaps in the pre-hours and after hours, these are not times when stop orders are reliable. And if you get filled, quite often it will get you filled far lower than perhaps you initially intended. So you don't want to get yourself caught in that. If you buy a put at a particular strike, guess what? You're, you're stopped out. You're hedged at that strike. That's the value. That's the benefit of buying an option contract. The world can melt down. Well, as long as OCC is still around, you'll have some on the other side of that contract uh, to get you out at that strike. Now, the downside of all that nice, reliable protection, as I mentioned, it's going to cost you. So that's where people usually start scratching their heads and saying, well, maybe what can I do to mitigate some of this outlay? The most basic first step everyone takes as a way to mitigate that is taking that basic long put you just bought, 3% out of the money, 5% out of the money, whatever it is, whatever you decided to be, and now selling a further out of the money put against it. Turn that basic put 
into a put spread. So buying one out of the money put, selling one farther out of the money put. So maybe let's say you buy a 5% out of the money put, you sell, let's say in this scenario, a 10% out of the money put. Now you've covered yourself in that 5% range. So the pros of that are going to be, well, it's going to cost you less because you sold the contract against the one you just bought. The downside of that, pun intended, is of course, you can see by that example I just laid out, you're not protected beyond that 10%. So you have limited protection as opposed to the effectively unlimited protection that you had just buying the put itself. So those are just some basic scenarios. We'll get into more advanced ones. Maybe let's go around the horn first though and get everyone's thoughts and takes on these basic strategies. And maybe, you know, as Eric alluded to, maybe is the horse already out of the barn? Let's start with the director of risk cert because you spend your days pretty much doing that as well as some of the more advanced strategies we're going to get to in a second. What are your thoughts on these advisors now who are coming to guys like Eric or other areas or listening to a show like this and saying, hey, maybe I should get into these types of hedging strategies and your thoughts on these these basic strategies and pros and cons of your basic long put versus your basic put spread, sir? So one of our mottos here is always invest it, always hedge. And, and the reality is because it's extremely difficult to time the market. Now, you know, there's a saying, right, every dog has its day. I've always said every hedge has its day. You know, there are better structures for short term violent corrections, which we currently looks like what we're doing. Um, And then there are other types of hedges that are better for more prolonged type bear markets where you're going to see those 20 percent plus moves to the downside. Um, So it really depends on, you know, what an advisor believes. Is this going to be the typical seven, maybe 10 percent pullback that we've been seeing? And then and then the buy the dippers are going to come back in. Um, you know, what if an announcement that there is a cure happens tomorrow? You don't think I bet futures rally 100 handles in like an hour, uh, you know, could be a snapback reaction. But, um, you know, shorter term hedging is going to be expensive after an event has happened. If you look at the April at the money put, it costs a little over 3 percent. If you annualize that, you're looking at a 23 percent cost if if that pricing continues the rest of the year over the next 12 months. So it can be very expensive if you're going to short uh, put if you're going to hedge for short term um, environments. I think at this point, um, you need to be a little bit more tactical and, and maybe lean on put spreads, if you will. That's going to cut down some of that vague exposure and some of that volatility exposure. Because right now, with the VIX of the 28, even though it could go higher, I mean, this is a really good entry point to sell premium. I'm like, again, but if you're worried about more downside, as you know, Matt and I have alluded, that there could be some more downside here, you know, then you have to do, you know, I know we're talking about hedging, but. You have to do limited risk type strategies if you're going to take advantage of this high volatility. But is it too late? Again, you know, the converse is cut down on some of the vega if you're going to be buying premium right now because if the market turns around, then it's, it's, going, to, it's going to deflate very, very quickly. 23%. That's, that's a lot of your portfolio to spend just to hedge for the rest of the year, listeners. So bear those types of costs in mind, particularly, obviously, we're in an extreme environment right now, so those prices are going to be very high. But on the other hand, you, you get what you pay for. You get that protection a lot of people want out there. Matt, same question for you as you're hearing these advisors are starting to tiptoe over to Eric's booth and ask about hedging, asking if it's too late. What are your thoughts on that as well as some of the pros and cons of these, these very basic hedging strategies of the long put versus the long put spread, sir? Yeah, so I was uh, doing the same thing for my personal account and, and went and looked at those puts that are crazy. The cost you know, was amazing. But uh, so – so were the very out of the money put. So I was able to do a, a fairly wide, maybe a 20 point in the SPY uh, put spread, and maybe I paid, I don't know, 250 for it. So, you, you know, if you, if you find a good relationship, you could still, you know, you could buy one and sell another way out of the money and have a pretty good ride. Um, and so, you know, that kind of worked out for me. You know, it was so expensive that I couldn't just buy a put, but, you know, when you do it, against something else, then that's when it can really work. So that's when I like the put spread. I still like the very long term, I'm talking, you know, September of 2021, seven delta or 10 delta or 15 delta. Those are the ones I just have in my portfolio at all times. Like Chris says, you can't really time these things. And it's nice to have those on because they don't decay very much. They're not very expensive. And uh, you know, from a in relation to the at the money of, of these ones in the market right now, um, and so those there there is still time, and I think you know you still want to be hedged. You still like like I said, I I still feel the market has a ways to go. It's kind of everyone's collecting themselves, figuring out what's what's going on. 
it's a very psychological thing that happens. It, it's the stages of grief I think we're going through in this market, and we're not quite through it yet. We have a ways to go. So, yes, you know there are there are things to do. Uh, I'd be very wary about selling anything naked. Or my old favorite strategy is is buying one close to the money, selling two out of money. I won't, I'm not doing that now because you just don't want to have any short units. I never really had short units because I'd always buy uh, out of the, far out of the money put. Uh, both strike and di- and days to expiration. So I think there is time. There are some tasty looking put spreads in there. There's some skews that are a little off. I, I like to just go in and, and do some hunting and pecking um, for uh, f- those relationships. Where do you think the market is going to go? Where do you think it'll collect itself? So maybe that's the put you sell and you buy the put near to the money. So those are the types of things I'm looking at, Mark. Interesting. That's the old market maker in you picking up some seven Delta puts just just in case. You know, you never know, right? So when those bad boys could come in handy, always pays to have a few bullets in the old chamber for events like these. And uh, <laughs> that's interesting uh, in and of uh, in and of itself, listeners. And you're right. The put spreads, if you're savvy with them, if you play with where you sell that second leg and take advantage of some of that dramatically overpriced Put skew out there. Maybe you can find levels that are certainly more attractive than just going out and buying, I think, as Chris said, uh, 23% for the year at the money uh, puts there in SPY and SPX. That's, that's a heck of a lot to do to your portfolio listeners. Now, some other ways. Let's get a little bit more advanced, get a little bit options 201 uh, here for some other ways to pay for protection. I've joked before on this program and on the network that a significant percentage of the options industry spends their days looking for ways just to pay for puts. <laughs> so if you're doing this yourself now, listeners, you're not alone. Quite a few brilliant minds are doing the exact same thing. A lot of interesting ways to do that. Let's start with uh, what I've we termed in the past the holy grail position for advisors. And this is the basic collar. So now you're taking that S&P put that you just bought, let's say 5% out of the money in our example, and you paid a lot for, as Chris just alluded to. And you take that and now you say, well, okay, I'm going to start – looking for ways to offset some of this. And, you know, if the S&P continues to rally, let's say up 5%, I'm, I'm okay selling the S&P at those levels as well. So I'm going to turn around and sell now a covered call against my long S&P portfolio. So now if it rallies 5%, I'm going to sell the portfolio. i got that call income coming in. It's not going to offset the price of that put because, as we all know, puts are more expensive than calls in broad equity indices, particularly in an environment like this. But it's going to mitigate some of the cost of doing that. And then you could always turn around and do the the collar with the kicker, which is effectively you have that collar, you sell the covered call, you buy the put, and now you do what we talked about before, that, that put spread. So you buy the 5% out of the money put, you sell the 10% out of the money put against it. Now you have that range at which you're protected to the downside. And then you turn around and sell, in this example, a 5% out of the money call. So now you have two income legs that are helping to pay for that one long premium leg. So your hedging is going to be limited to that 5 to 10% out of the money range, but still, you're not going to pay a ton for it as well. So that's another way you could approach it and get active with some of your trading. And there are many others as well. I could explore some more, but let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the director of risk, because Mr. Director of Risk, this is what you do. When you're not talking to me, this is how you spend your days, sir, which is getting out there and implementing the SWAN DRS, which, as you mentioned, is a hedged equity portfolio. So you have the put. You like your long-term puts in the DRS. But then you're also writing near-term premium against it. So uh, walk us through what are some of the ways you like to go to pay for your protection, sir. It's a great question. Um you know, I mean, everyone's pretty familiar with the risk premium, and, and even though there's been some cor- compression over the last few years because of a lot of entrance into the business and and just the way the marketplace has been trading, uh, you know, and I'll refer to times like this. It's very important to have some bullets or, or to keep some powder dry. Um, obviously, selling premium or selling puts, and then having the market drop, you know, uh, seven, six, six, seven percent in five days is not going to be good to any short premium 
any uh, any short premium program that's not delta hedged at least. So it's important to have some some bullets free. It's important to you know this is where risk management comes in. Uh, you know basic rules like don't let options go into money. Um, you know always monitor that kind of thing. Monitor risk. Things change right now. It's kind of like you know like our traders on the desk. I mean we are in high vol mode, which means don't work your orders. Get your stuff done quickly um, because you don't know how you know futures could move on you 10, 15 handles in, in a clip. So you know we've got you know regular mode I guess, and then we've got high vol mode. And so when we're in high vol mode, you know we may move our adjustment points we may give things a little bit more room or or we may be you know we may adjust and, and play defense uh, a little earlier because i mean the objective especially when you're short premium is you don't you can't you know you're you're dealing with short gamma and that's not a good thing i mean theta is great when it's working but these are the times when the gamma you know like matt said earlier you know the long the long option people are, are, are winning the game right now so if you are a premium seller and you're trying to get income in your portfolio this is where you make your money really in my opinion you're, this is this is what separates the people who are going to make it or not make it because it's it's you know, when, when you have the perfect marketplace, anyone can sell a put and make money. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I've always said. It's, it's, can you sell a put during those times and continue to, and, and then defend those puts during these times that will separate you and, and, you know, you'll be able to stay in the game much, much longer. Yeah. It's the old adage, right? Selling puts, it works until it doesn't. You have to have a plan for weeks like this when it clearly doesn't. And you have to have some other strategies or perhaps just uh, keep your powder dry or get a little bit more savvy. With some of your strategies. Speaking of getting savvy, Mr. Matt, I know you like some interesting ways uh, to pay for that protection out there. You kind of just mentioned put spreads out there. You've talked about interesting things like ratios in the past, too. So if an advisor is coming to you right now and saying, hey, I, I want to hedge my, let's say, spy portfolio, but it's a wee bit pricey, what are you recommending to them right now, sir? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I like a caller, but again, I think in these types of environments, you, Doing a, a straight selling of a call, uh, you're, you're going to miss some violent moves upwards. So you could still get a fair amount of premium by doing a call spread. So you know, call spread, put spread, caller, uh, something like that for for protection, and, and you're, you're selling options around it. Um, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you know, a, a regular butterfly, and then moving one of the legs out a little bit, you could actually collect some collect some premium without much uh without much risk and and then you know it it tends to give you a chance to get out um if it goes against you so those are the two things that i like to do like now i won't do like a naked collar i would do more of a put spread collar because the the and, and a call spread collar because uh you know of the violent moves that we're seeing and also there's so much uh you know there's just so much premium now that um, you know, you have to get, you have to change your strategies to, you know, a high ball environment like, like Chris is saying. Mark. Yeah, we're all kind of in, as to use the old term, a fast market these days as things are, are whipping and rolling around out there. So, yeah, a lot of different ways you can do it. Matt likes his butterflies as well. But, you know, let's, let's just overview really quickly. Basic long put. It's attractive. It stops you out effectively, reliably. You don't have to worry about overnight risk. You're, whatever level you buy, whatever strike you buy in, you're stopped out there. Of course, the downside is that's extremely expensive. So now you have to explore ways to really pay for that. The most basic way, of course, being the basic long put spread. Buy one put out of the money, sell one farther out of the money, put against it. Is not going to offset all your costs. But as Matt said, if you're judicious with where you line up on the skew there and on the strikes, you can do better than uh, perhaps you might think. And then you can start playing with it a little bit more. Uh, the collar is one of the most popular strategies for a lot of advisors out there. Buying a put and then selling a covered call against it. Not going to pay for all of your put, going to pay for a good chunk. You could augment that with turning that collar now into a put spread. So now you bought one out of the money put, sold a farther out of the money put against it, and also sold an out of the money call against that. And you can always play with the months and the durations there. Maybe you push your Put a little bit farther out, three months, maybe six months. I know I know Chris and the, and the folks at Swan like to go out a couple of years with their puts, and you keep the premium selling ends very near term, so you play with the decay. That way, there are a lot of ways you can augment these strategies, listeners. We're kind of just giving you the basic overview right now. You can also turn that into a ratio put spread by one, and then if you are comfortable in this environment, getting along more of, in this case, S&P at a particular strike. You say if it drops below, we were just talking about 3,000 earlier. You say to yourself, hey, if it drops below 3,000, I want to buy more, then you can indeed sell two puts at that level. So you have the one-to-one -one put spread and then an additional put that you're short. That will, of course, get you long at that level below it, uh, but also it will reduce a lot more of the cost 
of that put. And then, of course, you can wrap it all up together with the collar. So now you have the collar where you're selling the covered call. You're buying one out of the money put, selling one out of the money covered call, and you're selling two farther out of the money puts against it. So there are a lot of different ways you could play with this strategy, playing with the duration, playing with the times, playing with the number of short premium legs that you have to try to offset the cost of that put. But bear in mind, you probably will have to do something in this environment to really, uh, really hedge success. Let's go back around the horn really quickly and get people's just final thoughts here on hedging in these kind of pandemic spooked markets right now. Let's start with you, Eric, because you kind of brought it up. You said people are coming to you these days at the various events that you go to. And these are the environments when, when the options guide tends to be a little bit more popular, when people pick up the phone when you call, when they stop by your booth. So what are your thoughts, Eric, on advisors right there out there right now who are perhaps considering hedging in this environment? And maybe your thoughts on, on some of the strategies I just outlined there, maybe the pros and cons, or maybe you have an alternative suggestion. If so, sir, have at it. Well, you know, Chris said it really eloquently as well. You know, look, it's expensive right now, and I think that's one of the things that sort of deters some advisors. But, you know, in situations like this, we, we look for these kind of things because just as you said, Mark, it, it sort of does bring the masses maybe over to the booth. Or this is a, a selfless shout-out to the investor services in a group in Chicago, the 888 Options guys, which we all know. Uh, to Please encourage your listeners to use that service through the OIC. I, I think at times like these, it refocuses some advisors who might have been on the fence. You know, uh, you know Matt, obviously, you know, was, you know, talking about the collar as well, and that was – with a little more sophistication, some of the advisors who were there at this conference we're talking about who've been in the business a little bit longer, um, you know, have, uh, have focused on that. But, you know, again, I think the, the overall theme is, is that at, at times of uncertainty and some of this, you know, kind of real, real strong volatility, it, it does, I, I hope it's not short-sighted with advisors. I mean, and I think I'm picking up sort of some of what Chris and Matt are saying is, is that they really shouldn't be short-sighted. You know, Matt talks about going uh, further out, and, and, and I think advisors are sort of contemplating that, where they're, they're as, as we know, Mark, you know, that cliche, options provide options. So that there, there are some of those, you know, it's just not, it's not a one-stop shop. There are other types of strategies that you can mix together that the client and the advisor together need to know, you know, what, what really do they uh, want to, you know, what, what is their ultimate goal? And if it's if it's a short term situation, you know they got to be careful about about what they're doing. Mr. Director of Risk, same question for you, sir. Some final thoughts for the advisors out there who may be thinking about dipping their toes into the hedging waters these days, sir. Well, I don't think it's too late, but I do think that um, at, at these levels, anyways, you have to be cognizant of taking too much long exposure, right? Long Vega, if you will. So spreading it off is a very good idea at these levels. You know, if the volatility does. If you get some relief rallies, like, you know, usually you should see in normal trading markets. Remember those guys where things used to go back and forth? Um, you know, there could be some opportunities <laughs> there to, to pick up some volatility, you know, if you can kind of get in there and time that. Um, and I, I agree with Matt 100%. I didn't mention it. But if, you know, I would be very, very careful about putting a straight up caller where your short calls. I mean, some of the most vicious snapback rallies. Um, have been during bear markets and during high volatility times. So the last thing you want to do is, you know, you don't want to get shaken out where you, know, you get one of these snapback rallies for 100, 150 handles, your short call goes in the money, then you're defending that and rolling that and saying, what did I do? And then the market turns back around and drops 200 handles. So that that's not a good situation to be in as well. So again, I think uh, caution right now um, – is, is really what you need to do, especially if, if you're trying to construct option positions, option strategies. Matt, you get the final word, sir, for uh, any advisors out there who are intrigued or perhaps intimidated by hedging in these environments. What do you have to say to them, sir? Yeah, I, I would echo what, what Chris says and, and, and also watch out for any um, you know, naked short units. Do not do that now. Um, and then I'd like to also say that there are Vega uh, – there are Vega plays that are uh, going to move a lot, like the, the the near term. But then the the Vega on the on the far term, uh, maybe two years to expiration, they don't move that much. So that I think you know, if you want to get something, um, it hasn't risen that much. I've you know, that, those are the 
that's kind of where I play out, out in those things, way out of the money. If you, you know, I, I think there, it, this has another leg down to it. Um, you, you know, I, I would say either very long term or do it with spreads uh, for protection, and and don't go give away your upside. There are some violent rallies that will happen, you know, extremely quickly. Uh, you don't want to be in a, in a position where if the market comes back, you, you've got nothing. You know, so those are those are the things that I, that I think about in, in these types of market. Mark. Good. There you go. Good food for thought for everyone out there. And now, speaking of you guys out there, let's get to some of your thoughts with a little bit of our office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody. Welcome to the office hours, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins. We already touched on that comment or that question from Neli, who uh, liked Matt's prediction from last show on Nobody's Models. Now we got uh, Brett. Brett Hayes here wants to know, uh, my clients keep asking about crypto investments, specifically Bitcoin. I can't entertain many of the current products available on the crypto, and he puts exchanges in quotes here. I, I'm with you there, Brett. They are mostly exchanges in quotes. He says, I can't use the products available on the crypto exchanges for reasons you can probably guess. Would you recommend the listed derivatives on CME or ICE as a point of entry for my clients looking for some exposure? Where do you feel this product fits into standard portfolio diversification? Thank you for taking the time to answer my question. There's a lot of questions in there, one of the things we have pointed out on our Crypto Rundown show is the advent of these new listed uh, Bitcoin options and futures on venues people have actually heard of, namely ICE and CME and a few others. SIBO had them briefly, uh, not so much anymore. As opposed to venues, you have to tunnel in through the VPN, particularly if you're here in the U.S. It makes it much more palatable and indeed viable. For a lot of advisors like you, Brett, and a lot of others who've written into this program and others uh, with a similar thought, these products are now things you can use in your client's account. So certainly if you are getting a lot of client demand and you are looking for these, uh, those are definitely uh, much more palatable ways, I think, for you guys to go than uh, some of these other products. I wouldn't recommend uh, you know, tunneling into a Deribit, for example, on behalf of your clients. Probably not the best move. Now, there's downsides of that because, of course, they're not the most deep or liquid products yet, so the spreads are going to be a little bit wide. Uh, the futures are doing pretty robust volume, particularly over there on CME, but not so much uh, on the options yet. And on ICE, they're both a little bit anemic, so... Bear that in mind. If you get farther away from front month around at the money, it's going to be pretty wide. So bear that in mind. Hopefully the liquidity will improve. But at the very least, this should remove one barrier to entry for you on behalf of your clients and that these are venues that you could actually reasonably hope to trade on and we, you could use in a lot of these uh, IRA and custodian type accounts and maybe otherwise other venues, other products you simply couldn't use. I know, Matt, you're kind of my, one of my go-to crypto guys. What are your thoughts here for Brett? And uh, do you think these, uh, the advent of these new products is finally the entry point for a lot of advisors out there, sir? Yeah, I mean, you have to be very careful. I mean, one of the things, even think of it like gold. Um, and with gold, you, you do want to have the physical if the, if the uh, markets really turn sideways and you know banks start having problems and shutting their doors and everything. You want to have some physical. There are, there are bullion exchanges, et cetera. I hope that starts to pop up a little bit more. I, I have found one that's doing it for crypto. I don't want to recommend it because uh, – for various reasons, but there are some out there that, you know, because I think it is a little bit difficult to own crypto with the, uh, you know, cold storage and 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 all those types of things is pretty confusing for some of your clients. Um, I, I do think you could get some exposure though. I mean, e even I like to buy GLD or S SLV and to get some exposure at certain points. So, um, I mean, I like having crypto in my uh, in my portfolio, not not a huge amount under five percent, but still some. To you know, back in the day when it was a hundred, people were saying it's going to ten thousand, and I go, "You're crazy! It's never going to ten thousand. Where did it go? Ten thousand. So you know, now they're saying hundred thousand. So who knows? You know, so 
Also, another thing that's good with crypto is, you know, if, if if the Fed keeps printing and the fiat goes goes south, I mean, you have you have uh, uh, an asset that that isn't as reliant on the banking system. So, I think for those reasons, you know, having a little bit, I think it gives you a little bit of peace of mind. It's tough to do it on these exchanges. Um, you know, if, if you had some background in, in how to set up a wallet or, you know, they have some pretty uh, sophisticated pieces of, of hardware that you could carry around, uh, you know, that's interesting. I think that, you know, that does a very good service to clients. I wish I had an advisor that, that knew a little bit more about, um, you know, what to, you know, how to get exposure to, to crypto. So I think start to think about it now as an advisor, learn about it. Um, it's it's going to be, it's just getting more popular and more popular as you know, Mark, I've always been ambivalent about it, but you know, it had a little bit. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people feel that way. So, I, I don't know if, if that's too rambling of an answer, but um, that's my position on crypto. All right. Next up, we've got who have we got? N N Gallagher. He wants to know. <laughs> he wants to know uh, what is the day to day like for the director of risk in this risk off environment? Well, Mister Mister Director of Risk, you're out there hedging all this risk that's going on right now. So. Mr. Neil, I'm guessing Neil could be Nick. Who knows? And probably a lot of our other listeners want to know what's that day to day like. You're out there trying to pay for that, pay for that protection, sir. What's it like for you these days out there in this a crazy, risky environment, sir? Well, I'll take it from the easy side. Having the hedge on in place before you know these sell offs, um, that's a good thing. You're not much, you know, keep a watch on it and and uh, make sure the pricing doesn't get exorbitant or which would mean an area to sell off or, or go again, make an opposing trade, if you will. I mean, the challenge, like I said earlier, is really managing whatever short uh, option premium trades that you had on before the events. You know, that's where the risk management comes on. Um, but then also waiting for those uh, opportunities to put more of it on. I'm not saying use leverage or double up or triple up or anything like that. But again, you know, I said earlier, you have to leave some bullets. You know, you can't go into a full position all the time because these events happen and they come out of nowhere. So you have to be prepared for that. So uh, are things a little bit busier on everybody's trading desk right now? Sure. I mean, you, you threw out that stat with all that volume. So everybody is in, like you said earlier, love the term, haven't heard it in a long time. We're in a fast market right now. Um, so we do have to keep our eye on the screens a little bit more and, uh, no lunch breaks. No lunch. It's the old school. I used to go down to the pit. I never left. I put a, I put an illegal, uh, illegal <laughs> lunch bar, one of those cereal bars in my jacket, try to smuggle in some water if possible. Cause that was all verboten on the floor listeners. And you sat there, you, I should say you stood there uh, all day long. It sounds like Mr. Director of risk and the crew doing that over there as well. All right. We'll wrap it up with this one from Alan. Alan wants to know, when corporations announce massive surprise dividends, is this accounted for in the options? Or is there an opportunity to purchase puts, take advantage of the expected sell-off in the underlying stock? Thank you. Well, this is a timely one. We had a bunch of questions about, I'm blanking on what the ticker is right now, but this just happened within the last few weeks to a month. We saw a name, I think it was LifeLock. That's the one it was, the Semantic Norton LifeLock. They kind of merged together. And they announced a ridiculous, I think it was like a $12 dividend out of the blue. So everyone started writing into us saying, oh, my God, these puts are not reflecting this. This is free money. I'm going to gobble all these up. And what I always do in scenarios like this for you, Alan, and everyone else out there listening, is whenever you see something like this, a weird corporate action in the name, the first place I go is to the OCC website. Not OIC, the OCC, the Options Clearing Corp. And they have a search bar in there. And you type in the ticker. And they hit search. And you see what you find. Chances are you're going to find a circular announcing there's some sort of adjustment to uh, the underlying ticker, which will account for this surprise dividend. And that's exactly what we saw happened with uh, the Norton LifeLock name and most of these other surprise dividends. At the end of the day, unfortunately, there is no free money. It may seem like it. Oh, my God. These puts are not reflecting this crazy dividend at all. But the truth is there's an adjustment probably coming. And if you ever have a question about what's happening in terms of what's happening at a ticker, OCC is the place to go. Mr. Eric, as our duly appointed representative of the OCC by way of OIC, would you agree with that advice, sir? I would agree with that advice, Mark. And yes, and that's why I kind of uh, gave a shout out to this phone number as well. For those advisors that aren't paying attention and writing down the the website, Mark, uh, maybe they'll remember the easy 888 options because uh, our folks at OIC, the Option Industry Council, and the Option Clearing Corp, but uh, absolutely, Mark, the Option Clearing Corp website and then optionseducation.org, 
uh, our folks are there actually to to answer those kind of questions. And you know that's 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 what we're here for. Full service. Full service indeed. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means the service for this episode has come to an end. Hopefully, you found something interesting and worthwhile in this. I know from your your feedback and email that a lot of you do. <laughs> so uh, keep those questions, those comments, those insights, those pearls of wisdom coming. But before we go, let me go back around the horn, check in with everybody, see what they have cooking that may interest you, particularly in these volatile environments. Let's start with our, our friend there, Mr. Cott. You mentioned kind of the OCC website. You guys are always updating and tweaking and adding to that. So if you have anything new there you want to let us know of, by all means, do that. Also, if you have any interesting studies, you guys are always working on, working on interesting stuff. Uh, now is the time, Mr. Cott, sir. The floor is yours. Well, I appreciate being on, Mark, as usual, all the support that you provide to the industry, and kudos to Matt and to Chris as well. Uh, one of the things I will say is that uh, uh, Chris's firm, Swan, has also uh, launched a options course through IWI that there is a course that uh, had been out there already that we worked on with, uh, with in the Investment Wealth Institute. So I highly encourage a lot of your listeners uh, to either go to Swan or go to IWI and take a look at that. I think that really helps kind of reinforce a lot of this, Mark because there's a tremendous amount of information that gets thrown out. And I think uh, for a, a majority of advisors, they might want to kind of refresh this and, and kind of get an opportunity to maybe, you know, um, up their knowledge. Uh, I also would say that uh, relative to the OIC website, we have some tremendous webinars and content that are out there. So I encourage your listeners to go there and, uh, and, and frequently kind of kick the tires with our investor services group. There you go. Check it out. It's optionseducation.org. You mentioned the number, of course, as well, 888-OPTIONS. Not just for retail. Anybody can call that. If you have a question about these adjustments or anything, all these hedging strategies, they'll they'll walk you through all of that and a lot more. Of course, all that data, all those studies we're always talking about. You want to arm yourself with some data? So when you sit down with your clients, talk about options, you have some numbers behind you, backing you up, optionseducation.org is the place to go, particularly that advisors tab. Check that out. A lot of great data over there for you. And you kind of invoke the director of risk. So let's start over there next as well. Mr. Chris, if folks are intrigued, they want to learn more. Maybe they want to talk to you guys because you guys do this day in, day out. You pay for hedging pretty much every day. And they want to maybe pick your brain on this. Maybe they want to trade the DRS. Maybe they want to do something else along those lines. Uh, Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, uh, let me start out. I do want to hit that dividend question again on the next show because there's a couple of great answers and and variants to that. So I thought that was a really good question from uh, Alan. Um, Eric already mentioned the 10-part series on options that we have out there, and we've got a couple of new pieces on our website, how to manage loss aversion with clients. Um, you know, Loss aversion is a very powerful yet least addressed investor bias. Um, and then there's another one, how to address recency bias with clients, which is pretty important because you know investors place a, a lot, m- maybe too much importance on, on recent information um, while discounting too much of older information, and that usually leads to poor investing decisions. So um, all this information can be found on our website, swanglobalinvestments.com. There you go. Check it out. Swanglobalinvestments.com is the place to go. And give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at Swan. Global. And last but not least, a lot of you liked his prognostication. Maybe you didn't. Maybe it spooked you. But either way, it came to fruition. Mr. Matt, they want to reach out to you, share their thoughts on your volatility and uh, indeed market prognostication. Maybe they want to reach out for some earnings reports or back tests or all the other fun stuff you guys do over there at ORATS. Uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, yeah, we have a lot going on. Matt at ORATS.com to get a hold of me directly. Uh, we have a new back tester coming out. Uh, an artificial intelligence to find the timing in our indicators, our great data that helped me uh, look at the market uh, last month. Uh, we're creating a, a, a fast SMV, a smooth market vol- values uh, feed. Uh, so that's uh, there's been a lot of things going on with ORETs. And uh, yeah, just uh, thanks to our clients for hanging in there. And, and uh, good to hear from you all that are writing. It's, uh, it's nice to hear the, the positive comments, Mark. There you go. You don't always get positive feedback when you're predicting such dire things, but people are people are in those moods these days. Give them a follow over there at Option Rats on the Twitter or just uh, orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com is the place to go. And on behalf of Mr. Matt and the Director of Risk and Mr. Eric, who is nicknameless, and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you guys. And we'll see you back here next month, hopefully with happier news and events to discuss here on the Advisor's Option. 
You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.